Hey everyone, welcome back to Here in Apologetics. I'm so pumped you're joining us today. Today is part seven of my cumulative case for Christian theism, and we're we'll going to be looking at the problem of evil today. If you're just joining us, the full playlist is linked down below. We're making a whole case from Christian the fourth of Christian theism. But for today, let's look at the problem of evil and get rolling. So Romans 8.22 says, For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. To this point, we've looked at a bunch of reasons to believe that God exists. However, we now face a great challenge. The traditional conception of God that most theists, including myself, hold to is the existence of an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving being. The traditional definition of God has led to challenges to his existence based on certain facts about the world, namely the existence of evil and God's apparent hiddenness. So, how can theists respond to these important objections? Let's explore. So, with the problem of evil, we can ask, how can the existence of God be reconciled with so much suffering in the world? Why would a perfect God create an imperfect universe? We can look to many kinds of evils in the world to see where the atheist is coming from when they present the problem of evil. First, consider the many moral evils that seem to occur. Moral evils are events that occur because of a human being inflicting them. Events such as the Holocaust, rape, torture, and the constant human cycle of war and corruption are all examples of moral evils. I think it is perfectly fair for the skeptic to claim to see inconsistencies between certain aspects of the world and the claim that an all-loving being is not behind it all. The second kind of evil is natural evil, which is though not the product of human beings, but a product of the universe we live in. Earthquakes, hurricanes, and animal suffering are all examples of tragic events that have occurred throughout biological history, which have caused massive amounts of suffering. The final class of evils that we will consider overlaps with natural and moral evils, namely gratuitous evils. These are evils that occur without a morally sufficient good coming from them. The skeptic argues that all loving God would prevent evils that do not occur for a greater good. So it seems as if the existence of gratuitous evils challenges the idea of the existence of God. So with the logical problem of evil, it attempts to show that there's a logical inconsistency in believing in an all loving, all powerful, and all knowing God when considering the existence of evil. Arguments against God's existence based on the existence of evil date back to the Greek philosopher Epicurus, who lived from about 341 to 270 BC. A more modern version of the problem of evil is given by philosopher J.L. Mackey. Mackey, in 1955, explained the problem of evil as such, quote, God is omnipotent, God is wholly good, and yet evil exists. There seems to be some contradiction between these three propositions, so that if any two of them were true, the third would be false, end quote. The logical problem of evil aims to show that if God truly was all-loving, he would do all that he could to prevent evil from occurring. In addition, since God is omnipotent, meaning he could do all things, he would be able to prevent all evils from occurring, from rape to hurricanes to animal suffering. But since God doesn't prevent these evils, he must not be all-loving and all-powerful. So an all-loving, all-powerful God does not exist. When responding to the logical problem of evil, it's important to remember the burden of the person presenting the argument to provide a sound argument with valid premises that has a conclusion that follows. With regard to the logical problem of evil, Mackey in 1955 further elaborates on his argument by writing, quote, Good is opposed to evil in such a way that a good thing always eliminates evil as far as it can, and there are no limits to what an omnipotent thing can do. From these, it follows that a good omnipotent thing eliminates evils completely, and, the, and then the proposition that a good omnipotent thing exists and that that evil exists are incompatible, end quote. Mackey's 1955 argument can be argue, formulated as follows. Premise 1, if God exists, evil would not exist. Premise 2, evil exists. So the conclusion, premise 3, therefore, God does not exist. However, I think hope is not lost for the theist. If the theist can show that there is good reason to think that one of the premises is false, there would be good reason to doubt the conclusion of the argument. For example, if there's good reason to think that a wholly good being would allow evil, Mackey's argument is in shambles. I think there is good reason to accept premise two of my formulation of the logical problem of evil, namely that evil exists. The question is whether the first premise would be true. If God exists, would he always eliminate evil? I think the answer is no. While the rest of this chapter will further dive into plausible reasons for why God would allow evil, it's fruitful at this point to give you a taste of what is to come. There are many plausible reasons to think that an all-powerful, perfectly good God would allow evil. First, evil may be the result of God creating free creatures who have the freedom to choose to do good or evil actions. Second, evil may be the result of God creating a knowable natural order, which allows for good such as scientific discovery, intelligibility, and a moral arena. Third, evil allows for some human autonomy from God. If there is no evil whatsoever and God valued human choice, how could we ever choose to be with him if we never accept experience separation from him? 
Fourth, in Christianity, there is a promise that evil will not last forever, but is a temporary pain to bring about God's great plan for the world. I don't think that any of these four points are decisive defeaters that will end the debate over the problem of evil. However, these four do not need to serve that purpose for the logical problem to fail. It is the burden of the proponent of, my, of the argument to show why the reasons to doubt the truth of the first premise fall short. If any of my reasons to doubt the first premise are convincing to you, then you should not accept the first premise of the argument, which would then lead to the logical problem of evil broken. Now, let's think about the evidential problem of evil. While there are many different forms of an evidential argument, a general formulation goes like this. Premise 1, the existence of evil is more likely on atheism than theism. So, premise 2, the existence of evil is evidence for atheism. These arguments don't set out to prove that God does not exist, but rather to show that the existence of certain kinds of evils would be more expected on atheism than theism. The theists may have other pieces of evidence, such as consciousness, fine-tuning, and religious experience for the existence of God, but the evidential arguments from evil don't serve to deny these pieces of evidence. In other words, evidential arguments from evil focus on a particular event, say moral evil, animal suffering, gratuitous suffering, something along these lines, and then argue that this event would be more likely to occur if atheism is true, then theism. So consider the purpose of evidential arguments. Tom is a true agnostic, meaning that he sees the question of the existence of God just as likely as the non-existence of God. Tom is 50-50 on the question of does God exist before having any knowledge about the problem of evil. When Tom considers the existence of evil, Tom's view on the probability of God existence changes. Tom believes that evil is what would be expected if there was no God, whereas it is unlikely that the event would occur if God existed. Tom now concludes that the existence of evil would be more likely to be true under atheism than theism. So Tom is now 75% confident God does not exist after considering an evidential argument from evil. This is the basic structure of an evidential argument. Note that the power of these arguments exposes the person-based nature of justification. In my story, Tom moves from being 50-50 on the existence of God to being 75% sure that God doesn't exist after considering the argument from evil. However, these arguments do not always work in this way, as shifts in the confidence levels are often dependent on the person considering the argument. One could say that the argument is successful and then conclude that there's only now a 51% chance God does not exist, or a 99% chance that God does not exist. The power of an evidential argument is often in the eyes of the beholder. Here's one concern I have with the problem of evil. It assumes that conscious life exists. So when someone claims that the existence of evil will be more likely on atheism than theism, we may ask, ask, first, what does atheism actually predict? Does atheism predict that 10 people would exist or 10 million? It seems neither. Atheism doesn't predict that conscious life would exist either, and you need conscious life for there to be evil. Atheism doesn't even predict the existence of a universe at all. If neither hypothesis predicts the data in question, means more likely than not to occur, then it will be challenging for the data to provide strong weight toward either view. The existence of evil is not expected given atheism because atheism does not predict the existence of conscious life. However, theism does predict the existence of conscious life. I do think that certain evils, assuming that conscious life exists, are more likely to be true on atheism than theism. But if God exists, there may be some reason to think that God would create a world in which evil exists. One way of addressing the evidential problem of evil also is to think that some evils are just evidence for atheism. Perhaps one may believe that atheism better explains the existence of evil than theism. If this is the case, the question is, how much of the problem of evil will move us towards atheism? Consider Tom, who is 50-50 on the existence of God. Perhaps Tom doesn't think that theism can explain animal suffering as well as atheism. Should Tom now be 51% confident in atheism or 95%? I say more like 51% because evil is only one piece of a much larger picture. Susie is 95% confident that God exists before encountering the argument from evil. Should she now be moved from like 90, like 95% confidence in theism to 50%, 94%, or something else? If, as this video in this book series, well, it's not a book series, but it's a video series, argues, atheism cannot explain things such as fine-tuning, moral knowledge, reason, and personal experience, the question becomes whether the existence of evil can outweigh all the other lines of evidence in favor of theism. I think not. Atheism does not even predict that conscious life would exist. So, one option for theists is that they can concede the problem of... The, they can conce one, pro one option for the theist is that they can concede the problem and argue that evil is not strong evidence against the existence of God. Second, I don't believe there are many, if any, instances of evil that cannot be explained by theism. I'm willing to grant that evil is expected on atheism, again, assuming that conscious life exists, which is a big assumption, um, but I do believe that there are numerous reasons to think that evil would not have a low likelihood of existing given theism. 
In the next section of this video, I will develop a more complete response to why God allows evil. For an evidential argument to be powerful, it must point to specific evils that cannot be explained by defenses advocated by theists. I don't believe that there are any such evils that theism cannot adequately explain. My basic thought is this. God allows evil for the preservation of human freedom, which allows for humans to grow individually, together, and with God. First, the Christian view is that the world we live in is imperfect. Paul in Romans 8.22 writes, quote, The whole creation has been growing together in the pages of childbirth until now, end quote. One of the central claims of the proponent of an argument from evil is that God would create a world with no or little suffering because of God's perfect love. However, a central Christian claim is that we live in a world with suffering given by God to serve certain purposes. It's important to consider God's purposes in allowing evil according to the biblical text. One great example of God's purpose in allowing evil is seen in John 9, 1-3. The author writes, quote, As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, it was, not this, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. End quote. From this passage, God's purposes for this world can be seen with greater clarity. This text shows that God isn't interested in maximizing pleasure or minimizing pain. God is interested in creating beings who manifest God's image and radiate his glory. Furthermore, evil also allows us to grow. Consider the creation of Adam and Eve. They're created with the task of manifesting God's image and being stewards of creation. Perhaps God's final purpose for this for us may be similar. Heaven isn't an eternal worship concert, but rather a new creation in which we'll be given responsibilities. Evils in this life help us to develop a character that will impact us in the next life. John Hick in 1991 writes that virtues, quote, which have been formed within the agent as a hard-won deposit of her own decisions in situations of challenge and temptation are intrinsically more valuable than virtues created within her ready-made and without any effort on her own part, end quote. Courage in the face of adversity is good. Perseverance through challenge is good. And love through difficulties is good. Finally, in Christianity, evil is a temporary thorn as God promises triumph over evil. Christianity holds that God will defeat evil at the eschaton. The world of suffering we experience will be transformed into a new creation. The evils of this world are temporary, and the next life is so much better than we can ever imagine. Death, I believe, is like waking up from a dream. The evils we experience in this life are a tiny but important part of what God has planned, as Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 2.9, quote, But as it is written, What no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has planned, or what God has prepared for those who love him. End quote. So, why would God allow moral evils, such as stealing, genocide, and other horrendous deeds done by human beings? I believe that God allows these moral evils for numerous reasons. Again, this is what I think. I'm not claiming to know the mind of God, but given my status of where I'm at right now, this is what I would say. First, these evils are caused by God giving humans freedom. One's choice to conduct these horrific acts is the result of God granting them free will to do so. God gives us free will because it, it gives us the ability to work together and to freely choose Him. These are good things that require humans to be free. Second, I believe that tragic events can draw us closer to knowing God. Pain is a means by which God wakes us up from wakes us up to our need of Him. When my friends died, the suffering felt by myself and others because of their death helped us to realize the fragility of life and the importance of coming to know God. Moral evils are the result of human freedom, which God can then utilize to bring about greater goods, such as people turning to God and following Him. Finally, moral evils allow us to grow. Through experiencing suffering, we can learn and grow as humans. Honesty is valued after experiencing dishonesty, love after hate, triumph after disappointment. If we were created perfect, we would not be able to grow. Why would God allow natural evils such as hurricanes? One idea about why God would allow natural evil is to allow for a knowable natural order. The reason that we can do things such as predict the weather, do science, and know what cl clothes to wear outside is that nature behaves in an orderly way. If nature did not act in an orderly fashion, governed by natural laws, it would, have been, it would be impossible for us to do science. Events such as hurricanes are a result of the world following a noble natural order. If we live in a fallen world with evils and a noble natural order, events such as hurricanes are inevitably just a part of reality. A world without any natural evil would be a drastically different world than the one we experience today. A noble natural order also allows for humans to have some autonomy from God. An important part of my explanation for the existence of evil is that God allows evil to preserve human freedom. 
If we lived in a world without noble natural, without a noble natural order, where God constantly intervened to prevent evils, it would then remove our human freedom to choose to live in a relationship with God. What about gratuitous evils that occur with any purpose or without any apparent purpose for why they occur? Philosopher William Rowan, 1979, has given a famous example of a gratuitous evil in his 1979 paper, The Problem of Evil and Some Varieties of Atheism. Quote, suppose in some distant forest, lightning strikes a dead tree, resulting in a forest fire. In the fire, a fawn is trapped, horribly burned, and lies in terrible agony for several days before death relieves its suffering. So far as we can see, the fawn's intense suffering is pointless. End quote. Rowe brings up this story to provide an example of an apparently pointless evil that he thinks would not occur if God existed. It seems obvious to me that suffering like this occurs in the real world, and that some explanations of evil, such as the free will defense, will not work in this scenario. So why would God allow for a universe with apparently gratuitous evils? I believe that it is inevit inevitable that if we live in a universe with some evil and a noble natural order, it would also follow that we would live in a universe where stories like Rose Fawns are, sadly, inevitable. Here's what I mean. Let's say that God creates a world with a noble natural order that is not a perfect world. This would allow for the world to be autonomous from God to some degree, and the world would follow natural laws that allow for events such as lightning strikes since the world is imperfect. Being that animals are an important part of our ecosystem, a fawn may be inevitably trapped in a tragic situation. This terrible suffering could be explained by us living in a fallen world that unfolds in a predictable way, allowing for human autonomy. Yet some might even question, like, why would God even create an, imperf an imperfect world in the first place? So, atheist Graham Oppie has brought forth an important argument, known as the problem of heaven, to ask, why didn't God create us in heaven? Oppie, in 2006, argues, premise one, necessarily there is no evil in heaven. Premise two, if there is morally significant freedom in heaven, then it is not the case that, necessarily, there is no evil in heaven. Therefore, there is no morally significant freedom in heaven. Premise four. Heaven is a domain in which the greatest goods are realized. Therefore, the greatest goods can be realized in a domain in which there is no morally significant freedom in heaven. Therefore, a perfect being can just a perfect being can just choose to make a domain that contains the greatest goods and no evil. Premise seven: A world that contains the greatest goods and no evil is non-arbitrarily better than any world that contains the greatest goods, incomparably lesser goods, and the amounts and kinds of evils that are found in our universe. Premise 8, if a perfect being chooses among the options and one option is non-arbitrarily better than the other option, then the perfect being chooses that option. Therefore, it is not the case that a perfect being made our universe. That's Oppie's argument. Now, first, it may not even be a problem to claim that there is no morally significant freedom in heaven. We have significant freedom in this life, so we can decide whether we want to serve God and grow in character. But once we make that choice, the freedom to do evil would not be needed in heaven. For example, in my current state, I could not just murder another human being. I may have the physical capacity to do so, but I couldn't force myself to do this. This is because of my character, which is formed over time by the choices I've made. Similarly, perhaps in heaven, we will no longer be able to make an evil choice because of our fully formed character. Furthermore, I believe that there could, that we could have more significant freedom in heaven, and there would still be no evil in heaven. Consider the child who puts his hand on the burner because he did not know any better. After the child puts his hand on the burner and he realizes the terrible pain he's experienced, he will almost certainly not choose to do so again. Likewise, once humans are in heaven and fully realize the horrific consequences of their evil deeds, they will not choose to sin even though they still have the capacity to do so. In addition, I think that some of the greatest goods require that evil exists. I believe that one of God's purposes for us in this world is to build our souls. If we were all created in heaven and experienced no evil, we would never be able to experience things such as courage in the face of adversity or integrity in the face of dishonesty. If there was no evil, these goods could not be realized, so God may allow evil to bring forth these goods. One might object at this point that many people do not get the chance to soul build, such as babies who die at a young age. This is a challenging objection, but I think several responses can be made. And again, I'm just saying, here's some plausible options in my mind. I'm not saying this is the case I know it, but this is what I think is just like possibly true. First, I think that for the one who dies young, their soul building could begin or continue in the afterlife. Second, the death of a child provides the opportunity for others, such as their parents, to grow in character in the face of adversity, perhaps even into the afterlife as well. I'm by no means trying to diminish the immense tragedy of losing a child, but I'm trying to shed some light on how a theistic explanation for these events could like flesh out. Furthermore, Oppie argues that God would always choose the better option. Why would God create a world of suffering in heaven coming later when he could just create a world of heaven? 
In addition to some of the goods not being able to be actualized in a world without suffering, I see no reason why God couldn't just create both worlds. Perhaps we aren't the only universe that God has created. It seems like when looking at the possibilities of an infinite being, creating two, three, seventy, or like 7,000 universes is plausible. Is it likely? I have no idea. But it seems to me that God could create multiple universes with differing degrees of goodness. As long as they end in a good way, God would have some reason to create them. Oppie's problem of heaven is an important argument that brings forth important objections. God's purposes for our lives goes beyond merely free will. God doesn't just want us to create, God doesn't just want to create perfect people. He wants to build souls that can fulfill his plans and share in his glory. Where is God? Behind the problem of evil, perhaps the second most common objection to the existence of God is the problem of divine hiddenness. This family of arguments looks at the supposed silence of God in the world, the existence of non-resistant non-believers, and other related ideas. Philosopher J.L. Schellenberg authored a famous book in 1993 titled Divine Hiddenness and Human Reason, which provides a logical argument from the divine hiddenness against the existence of God. Schellenberg in 1993 argues that there are no persons who are capable of coming into a relationship with God, but through no fault of their own, fail to believe. He then argues that if the traditional theistic God exists, there would be no such people. However, since there are these kinds of people, the traditional theistic God does not exist according to Schellenberg's argument. It's important to note that there are different arguments from divine hiddenness. You could argue from natural non-belief, God's silence when one pleads for him, the geographical distribution of religious belief, or other related ideas. Now, looking at Schellenberg's argument, first, it doesn't seem obvious to me that there are persons capable of personally relating to God, but by no fault of their own, fail to believe. These people, if they exist, are considered non-resistant non-believers. Non-resistant non-believers are people who do not believe in God or have a relationship with him, though they are genuinely open to that relationship without any resistance. However, this claim flies in the face of Christian theology. Romans 3.23 clearly states that we are all sinners. Psalms 51.5 says that we are, quote, brought forth in an inequity, end quote. Now, many skeptics would not accept the biblical data as evidence that there are no non-resistant non-believers. I think that there's good philosophical reason to think that there are no non-resistant non-believers as well. If God is perfect, our consistent imperfection would be an example of resistance towards God. Take the case of Joe. Joe is an imperfect person and sometimes desires to lie. Joe's desire to lie goes against the perfect nature of God who never desires to lie. So in some, in some sense, Joe's desires are contrary to God's desires. To some degree then, Joe would be resistant to God because he desires things which God does not desire. If this line of reasoning holds, anyone who is imperfect, which is last time I checked every human being, would be resistant to God since we have ungodly desires. If I'm right, premise one of Schellenberg's argument would be false. Furthermore, this argument assumes that God would always provide ample evidence of his existence to people who were genuinely, speak genuinely speaking him. It's possible that God may not want to reveal himself to a person at a given time because they will later abuse or later abandon their relationship with God. For this person, it may be better for them to not know God in the first place than to break or abuse the relationship. Perhaps for a person like this, God should withhold his presence from them. This period may even help them to come to grow in a way in which they would later know God properly at another point in life. These reasons show that a logical argument from divine hiddenness will not work, but it still leaves the burning question, why does God seem so hidden? Quote, love the word, it brings nothing. I'm told that God loves me, and yet the reality of the darkness and coldness and emptiness is so great that nothing touches my soul. End quote. These are not the words of a hardened atheist or the typical church-going Christian, but the words of a saint, Mother Teresa. A common assumption among theists and atheists is that if God is all-loving, he would reveal himself in a way that it would be obvious to people that he exists. However, I think there is very good reason to believe that if God exists, he would remain to hidden to some degree. Imagine that God exists, and they suddenly decided to build a giant temple in Israel, which, beyond any reasonable doubt, would prove to every person that he exists. If God's existence was made so obvious that no person would be able to reasonably doubt his existence, our freedom to choose God or not would be taken away from us. Our actions of faith and service of God were transformed from actions of freedom to the compelling feeling of having to serve God. The hiddenness of God allows for human freedom about whether we want to serve him or not. We are given the chance in this world to decide for ourselves whether we will serve God or ourselves, and God's hiddenness allows us to make this choice. Second, the hiddenness of God allows for humans to work together. God isn't interested in just creating beings who will worship him, but to create beings who can be co-rulers with God. Michael Heiser in 2015 notes, quote, Yahweh's original intention was that all humankind would be his earthly family, ruling in cooperation with him and his heavenly family, end quote. 
Consider the advances in the medical sciences. If God just provided supernatural intervention every time a person was sick, what would be the point of work, us working together to develop vaccines or inventing new procedures? God's hiddenness allows us to work together, discovering truths, and stops us from using him as a cosmic cop-out button. Third, God's hiddenness allows for us to participate in a more meaningful relationship with him. Consider my story of developing a relationship with my best friend, Carl. At first, I didn't like Carl and wanted nothing to do with him. Over time, I began to see Carl in a new light and to interact with him in a new way. I saw his love for others and his willingness to sacrifice for the greater good. Because of this, I desired to know Gar Carl more, and over time, we developed a meaningful relationship. Similarly, God's hiddenness allows for us to grow without being forced into a relationship with him. By experiencing this world, we can both grow in character and develop a more meaningful relationship with God. Fourth, I believe that God isn't all that hidden. I will... I am willing to grant that to some people, it appears as if God seems hidden. Sometimes it appears like that to me. But I also claim that many more people have claimed to have genuine experiences with God in their lives. It may not be every day, but many people have claimed to have these unique encounters where God doesn't seem hidden. If this is true, the idea, the idea that God exists in a hidden way would be a claim that most people believe is false. So, the problem of evil and divine hiddenness are challenging questions for a Christian to answer. But I believe that there are very plausible explanations for these phenomena. A noble natural order, human freedom, soul building, and the victory promised in Christ are promising answers to the problem of evil from a Christian perspective. Furthermore, the importance of who, human cooperation and freedom are plausible answers to the, most, to the problem of divine hiddenness. But it's time to turn. By defending the existence of God and the most challenging objections to theism, it's time to turn now to Christianity. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. This is part seven of my cumulative case for Christianity. We've looked at arguments for God and now arguments against God. And now we're going to turn to arguments for Christianity specifically. Um, the full playlist is linked down below. If video aided out, I encourage you to check it out and just keep rolling. But just click that playlist right there. See the whole videos. Um, and yeah, this is a here to apologetics. Have a good one, everyone. And God bless. We'll catch you later.